Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Power of Perseverance, a queer youth mental health panel hosted by It Gets Better Canada and celebration of tomorrow's Bell Let's Talk Day. My name is Omid Razavi. My pronouns are he, him, and I have the privilege of being the executive director of It Gets Better Canada. Before we begin tonight's event, we encourage you to reflect on the history of the land that you are on, who the traditional keepers of the land are, what the treaty relationship is, or if you are living and working on unceded territory. While we meet today on a virtual platform, I would like to begin by acknowledging that the land on which I gather on is the traditional territory of the Wendat, the Anishinaabeg, Haudenosaunee, Métis, and the Mississaugas of the new Credit First Nation. As we gather today as a collective to drive change in understanding the importance of embracing conversations around mental health while promoting diversity, equality, and inclusion, I encourage us all to reflect and acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past and to consider how we can each in our own way try to move forward in the spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. It Gets Better Canada is a registered Canadian charity and a proud affiliate of the It Gets Better project. We envision a day when no young person in Canada feels marginalized, isolated, excluded, or rejected because of their sexual orientation, gender identity, and gender expression. Through the power of storytelling and building community, our mission is dedicated to uplifting, empowering, and connecting to us LGBTQ plus youth across Canada. Your support by attending events like today, sharing our content on your social media channels, and through donations is what allows us to continue to operate. To find out more about our organization, please visit itgetsbettercanada.org. Or if at any time during this call or afterwards, if you are in crisis or in need of immediate help, please visit itgetsbettercanada.org forward slash get hyphen help for a list of resources near you. Today, we have created a safe space to address an important and timely topic, queer mental health. Over the course of the pandemic, nearly half of Canadians say their mental health has worsened. This is particularly acute for 2S LGBTQ plus youth who have grappled with school and rec recreation program closures and the resulting social isolation that has restricted many from accessing their support groups and chosen families. 2S LGBTQ plus youth already face heightened cases of bullying, depression, suicide, and suicide ideation. We continue to unpack the health impacts of the pandemic and have yet to grasp what the tail end of COVID has in store for our youth or what obstacles they will face. Today, we have the opportunity to connect with a unique lineup of voices who have offered to share their own experiences in an effort to inspire us all to better approach mental health conversations create solutions that are attainable and destigmatize the need for asking for help when help is needed. We wanna take a moment and recognize that these conversations can be challenging. We encourage anyone who is feeling unwell and needing support to prioritize their well-being and take a break from this event if need be. Following today's panel, we will also be offering a separate meeting room hosted by Bill Ryan, a social worker and adult educator who has been involved in sexual education and prevention related work since 1985 and someone that I've had the pleasure of working with on a few events. This post event meetup is for anyone in need of support following our event. We'll be sharing the link to this meeting near the end in our chat. For anyone joining that post event session, you'll be placed in the waiting room and have the opportunity to meet with Bill one at a time beginning at 8 p.m. Bill, did you want to jump on and just say a quick hello? Hello, everyone. I'm happy to be here. And I'm coming to you from Montreal, the traditional lands of the Mohawk and the Algonquin peoples. And uh, I am a professor of gender and sexual diversity at McGill University here, and uh, also have been working in support services for queer youth since the 1980s. So I'm very, very happy to be here and to listen to everything that we hear tonight, which I'm sure will be very, very helpful. Thank you, Bill. And you're also encouraged to ask Bill questions throughout the event. If, um, if you'd like, in, in the Q&A section, he will answer uh, throughout our chat. 
and you can ask openly or anonymously. Towards the end of the event as well, we'll be hosting a Q&A for our panelists. You can submit questions through our Q&A as well throughout the entire event. And uh, feel free to direct it to all our panelists or one in particular. So last year at Gets Better Canada I had the exciting opportunity to be featured on season two of Canada's Drag Race. A competition show unlike any other and one that has taken the world by storm. Beyond acting as a platform for inspiring makeup, fashion, and style, it has opened the world to queer perspectives and conversations. I cannot overstate enough the importance of what the show has done to inspire and raise confidence in our 2S LGBTQ youth, plus what it has done and what it continues to do to educate and build allyship around the world. Every now and then, this franchise showcases a very special episode that opens the door to additional voices and experiences to be shared. And today we have the distinct pleasure of hosting four of these teens from the Queer Prom episode. The vulnerability, courage, and tenacity that they shared resonated not only with us in Canada, but with people across the globe. I cannot be more honored to have such an inspiring and talented group of voices join us on this panel today. And I wanted to share a special message from one of It Gets Better Project's youth ambassadors. So we're just gonna share a quick video right now. I'm Ben. I'm one of the youth voices for the It Gets Better project in the U.S. And I just wanted to let you all know that when you sashayed into the workroom I was watching, um, I was overwhelmed with emotion, me and my mom. Um, because I have been working for so long and so hard to get people like us to be validated and recognized and represented. And to watch it happen on an international platform, it was just so amazing especially a group of amazing talented individuals be able to be vulnerable with your found family it was amazing and for time's sake i could talk about this forever but i hope i get to meet you all soon thank you ben uh who i believe is on uh watching right now as well and um definitely uh second the fact that i could talk forever about these amazing teens but i now have the distinct pleasure of introducing my amazing co-moderator from the moment they entered the workroom on season two of Canada's Drag Race, viewers knew they were one to watch. Isis Couture's journey on Drag Race was everything that was required for a true star to shine. Week after week, we experienced them overcome obstacles, share their heart, humor, vulnerability, as well as shine with their talent and amazing style. They didn't shy away from offering us deeply thought out looks, or weird and challenging concepts that continue to inspire us. For myself, it was watching Isis open up about their own mental health struggles while acting as a mentor that made them the queen of the season for me. Today, I have the privilege to introduce our co-moderator and winner of Canada's Drag Race season two, Isis Couture. Welcome, Isis. Oh, hold on, I'm old. I don't know how to work this. <laughs> <laughs> hold on. Hi. Yay. Hi, hi, everybody. Um, hi. I look a little different today, but it is me, Isis Couture. And I just want to say thank you, everyone, for coming and joining this conversation. We very much appreciate your engagement on this important conversation. And our plan today is to create a safe space for an honest series of conversations one that will hopefully leave you feeling inspired and empowered to address your own struggles and to support those in your life who require support during these challenging times. For myself, as I said on the show, um, I have struggled my whole entire life with my own mental wellness, my mental stability. I have chosen decisions in my life that I now regret um, because I didn't have amazing um, conversations like this when I was younger or amazing people that work at It Get Better to even speak to. So the conversation that we are going to have today with all these amazing people that I got the honor to get to know on the show and off the show is very important. And especially during the pandemic, um, it gave me a really big chance to sit back and reflect on my own work on my mental health. And even not only the pandemic, but being on the show and having all these amazing kids come onto the show 
Um, I deal with my own mental growth and work by myself in my own little bubble. And it kind of like made me feel like the world was so beyond and maybe we all weren't struggling as much as I did back in the day. Um, but hearing the stories from these kids on the show, I realized that it's continuous work and, and these issues still need to be talked about. And if I can help anyone by giving a little bit of advice or even just being me and showing everybody that you can go through really crappy times, but it honestly does get better. And um, I think this is just amazing. And I'm so happy that you're all here and I'm so happy to be a part of this. Thank you so much. Okay, do you guys want to meet our panelists? I can't see anything, so I think that's a yes. <laughs> okay, so first up, please everyone give a big welcome to Clover. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Hi, how are you? I'm great, how are you? I'm good, thank you. Next up, please give a big welcome to Ethan. Hi. <laughs> Hi, my love, how are you? I'm good, Isis, how are you? Oh, I'm good, baby, thank you for being here. Next up, let's welcome Friday. Hi, y'all. Yo, I love that energy. Yes. Thank <laughs> you. Um, How's the now, new year treating you? What's that? How's the new year treating you? It's good. I'm still locked in my house without a crown, just, just wanting to get out there, but uh, I'm doing great. I, I can't complain. Uh, next <laughs> up, my daughter from the show, <clears throat> my daughter in real life, please welcome Michaela. Hello, hello, hello. <laughs> <laughs> you can't ever just act normal, eh? <laughs> no, normal is not, it doesn't run in our family. Yeah, it doesn't. Not at all. <laughs> not at all. all right, so do you guys want to uh, jump into these conversations? Yes, let's do it. How's let's everybody it. feeling? Is everybody ready to have these uh, tough conversations? Yes? Definitely. Okay, thank you guys so much for being here. We really, really appreciate it. Um, let's start the conversation by asking how the past two years have been for everyone. The pandemic hit at a critical moment in each of your lives. As you set to finish off your last years of high school, but also at the time that is formative for many who are assessing your truth or making sense of your sexual orientation or gender, gender identity. What struggles, realizations, and or celebrations have you all encountered in the past two years that you'd like to share with us? Ethan, let's start with you. Oh boy, I'm biting the bullet. Okay, um, these last few years, uh, especially with being in a pandemic and graduating high school, it was really sad not having a prom and not having all the things that everyone did get. I mean, we did get the best prom ever. Don't get me wrong. Yes, you did. <laughs> yes, yes, we sure did. Uh, we did get the best prom ever, but um, it definitely was really disappointing not being able to have those things. And like you said, being queer, that was just kind of an extra level of things to deal with and go through. Um, kind of figuring things out in the last few years of high school. By grade 12, I definitely knew who I was, but there was definitely a lot of new questions now that I was becoming more familiar with terms, pronouns, all that stuff that um, a lot of different doors and questions were being opened for myself. Um, and then I got this opportunity and honestly, it was like the light in the dark. Literally, I tell everybody this story because it's one of my favorite, but the week before I actually got this opportunity to be on Drag Race, uh, my teacher, it was kind of leading up to um, Pride Month, and my teacher had kind of asked like what injustices we have seen throughout the school and what you would do to support the queer youth in our within our school community. And I sent this huge thing, and I guess she really liked it because she took, the, took it up with the class the next day. And um, we got to like really start those conversations and have those conversations. And that was kind of one of the first times that I was like, yeah, this is definitely something I wanna be doing for other people outside of just my school community. Um, I wanna help people. I want people to 
get the ounce of knowledge that I've been able to get over these last 18 years. And I think just for me being, especially on Canada's Drag Race was just an opportunity for me to kind of speak my mind, speak some things that I've really held deep within myself. And if it touched even one person out there, which I've gotten tons of beautiful messages, so I know it has, um, that, that for me was a highlight of the entire experience. So, yeah. Oh, I love you. <laughs> like, I love you more, stop. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing. Um, let's do Friday. Yeah, so boy, oh boy, these two years, right? Um, it's been a little crazy, but honestly, I think that I have had so much growth within these past two years. I have come to terms with my gender identity. I've started hormones, which has literally been life-changing. And I'm so, so thankful to have the privilege to have access to like trans healthcare. Um, Last year, I really focused on my positive self-image and self-talk because I'm still learning to love myself. You know, it's a challenge that I think we all deal with. Um, it's important to talk about. Um, but this year, and I hope to explore my path to independence a lot more now that I'm living on my own. Um, yeah, it's been great for my mental health and starting to from trauma it has just been, um, it's really been eye-opening. Um, Last year, I really tried to focus on how I could help the other queer youth at my school, just because I know what I was experiencing through my younger years, and um, I don't, I didn't want to, I didn't want to let other people experience that. And um, I guess Drag Race just came up, but other than that, I was also um, participating in my GSA. But my main goal for this is just to inspire other people like me, you know? Mm. I never saw a brown, queer, non-binary person when I was growing up. And I would love to like show people that you can be brown and queer and non-binary. Yeah, and beautiful. <laughs> you are, <laughs> you're absolutely beautiful. I'm so proud of you. Congratulations on all your steps. You're doing amazing. And I love you. Okay. <laughs> Next up, let's do Michaela. Same question for you. Honestly, um, these past two years have been life-changing, genuinely. Like, there's just been so much that's happened, so much growth that's happened for me. Um, like Friday, I feel like I've really come into myself and really um, found out who I am, not just as um, an artist, but as a person and as a trans person. Um, it's really been life changing to see how how much I've evol evolved from you know when the pandemic first hit, which was in the middle of my grade twelve year. Um, I believe it was like a week after we did our um, it was like our big main high school show, and like we were going to go into our final one, our last one for me at least. Um, and I just remember thinking like. I don't know what's going to happen next, but there is so much good coming. Um, and I really, I really held on to that. Um, and despite everything that happened, um, you know, leading up from like COVID to moving out and like not feeling my best to like having depression and trying to figure, figure that out. And then finding out that I'm, I'm trans and like trying to understand what that means for me. Um, through it all, I always found a way out of it. And I found the beauty from the pain and just became this person that you see today. And I'm, I feel like, I feel like the, the winner, you know, I feel like the queen. Hey, 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 <laughs> hey. <laughs> that crown belongs to me, stop. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, I, I'm just really, I'm really happy with everything that's happened this year. It's really built me up to be the mature, responsible person you see today. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, I personally am so very, very proud of you. And I just wanna take this second to uh, say to you, um, thank you so much for making me feel safe on the show. It's because of you, I felt comfortable enough to share my story with you and with the whole entire world. And it's something that I didn't really realize that I needed. And the fact that you came into my life and you helped me make that last step that I really needed, I will forever love you. And you mean so much to me. 
Oh my God, I love you too. And I miss you. I miss you too. <laughs> now get away from my crown. Okay, next. <laughs> next up, um, let's do Clover. Same question for you. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think just like echoing what everybody's said so far, past two years have been wild. Um, I think I'm grateful for like three main things. The first being um, being able to explore my arts and crafts and creative self-expression. Um, the most maybe important to me right now being dance and movement um, and being lucky enough to like train with, um, I'm training with like a footnotes academy right now, which I'm really grateful for. Um, and it makes me like really happy. And I think that's, that's something that's really cool. Uh, and the second being uh, being able to explore myself and my mental health and um, learn about boundaries and communication, which are mind blowing and quite life changing. <laughs> it's wild, <laughs> yeah. Um, how much communication and things like that can impact my relationships so much and make them so healthy. Whoa, wild. <laughs> um, <laughs> And also like transitioning, doing HRT, uh, hormone replacement therapy, um, and sort of coming into myself in that way and feeling settled with that. Um, and the third last thing would probably be the people. Um, I'm so grateful for all the lovely people I've been able to meet, especially these people here in the room with me right now. Um, I, I just had such, I'm just like so lucky that I was able to meet all these people that make me feel so seen and like represented. And I think that really played a role in improving my mental health and improving um, how secure I feel in myself because I can, I can have these conversations and have these connections with these people, with you basically. <laughs> yeah, so I'm very grateful. Thank you so much, Clover. It was so fun to see you on the show. Honestly, you are the coolest person I've ever met in my life. <laughs> You're just so authentically yourself and you just should be so proud of everything that you have accomplished so far. And you sharing your story on the show, like I'm, I'm obsessed. Thank you so much. Of course. I'm obsessed with you. Well, yeah, come on. <laughs> <laughs> wow, I'm, I'm just blown away. This, this, the insight that you're all bringing, I mean, Clover for you to mention communications and boundaries. I don't think I understood what either was at your age and for everything that you all have a grasp of. Um, it's so encouraging, so encouraging for all other generations or generations following you um, to thank you. But I would be remiss if I didn't ask Isis the same question about what the past year has been for you. Not only did you jump onto a major platform, but you were able to elevate your brand and carry on a message and then be met with highs and lows of closures, but then wins and then more closures. How has that impacted you in, in, in even in just the past three months? Um, before even going on the show, like for me, yes, I have made so many forward steps in my mental health, but even just taking the step to apply for Drag Race was so much for me. I wasn't sure if I was worthy enough to be on the show. Um, I, I didn't know if I could do it. And then I got on the show and it, it was even worse. <laughs> I struggled so much behind the scenes with just feeling like if I belonged there. And then when this episode with everyone happened, and I got to speak to everybody and I just felt more comfortable in myself because of everybody. I felt like I belonged there and the steps that all of you guys helped me make to actually feel confident in myself and feel proud of everything that I've done to get to the place that I am. Um, it's just been amazing. After leaving the show, after having that episode, I just feel so much more confident in my mental stability, so much more confident in myself and I'm just, I'm just so proud and like happy about my life and it's just yay. <laughs> <laughs>
Thank you. Uh, that episode was such a turning point for you. And it, it really is an episode for anybody watching who has not seen it yet. Please watch it. It's the Queer Prom episode. Not only will you see the, the moment that uh, Isis is referring to, but you're, you're also going to get a better sense of these shining stars that we have on our panel today. And Clover, I want to talk to you about um, a moment that happened in the show and then a follow-up question. When Isis refers to you as authentic, I think there was just such an authentic moment in the show where you shared your journey with gender and how you identify as non-binary. And I think that resonated with a lot, a lot of people, especially today as marginalized groups, transgender and non-binary individuals are subject to discrimination, violence, and limited access to opportunities granted to their cisgender peers. So while representation in mainstream media has increased over the past few years, we're seeing some great content out there. The pandemic, however, has elevated obstacles for transgender non-binary communities in ways that perhaps the queer community and allies don't fully comprehend. And I was hoping you'd be able to speak a bit on behalf of yourself and potentially your peers and how how this has been during the pandemic, how it's been elevated and probably shining a spotlight on mental health in particular. Yeah, for sure. Um, that's a really great question. Uh, I think I would start with acknowledging that I, I personally think I have a lot of privilege like socially and just with like the people I have in my life that support me. Um, and I'm very grateful for that. And because of that, it would might be like irresponsible of me to, to talk about this question just from my own individual perspective. But I do talk a lot with my trans friends and other people in my life I have that can relate to this experience. So that's like sort of the perspective I'm bringing. I'm not just gonna be talking from my own experience. Um, I think that generally the pandemic has been a really incubational time for self-reflection, um, not just for trans and non-binary people, but for everybody in general, um, being able to step away from everything and being expected to be by yourself and not around other people provides a lot of time for self-reflection. And in the context of being trans and non-binary, it provides a time to self-reflect on that. Um, and just a sidebar point to clarify for anybody who might not know, because I only recently found this out last year, um, trans and non-binary are distinct uh, identities. They can overlap. It can be like a Venn diagram. Somebody can identify as both trans and non-binary like myself, um, but they are distinct overlapping experiences. Um, but yeah, so when you step away from interacting with people, you step away from gender. Gender is a social construct. It's a social performance. And being able to um, distinguish yourself between your performance and yourself really allows for some self-exploration. I think that has some very positive developmental effects for young people and like me having experienced that in, during the pandemic. But the other thing is um, there's also some challenging aspects to that because um, on the one hand, you're forced to confront yourself and your gender, and that can be a very difficult process to go through coming to terms with who you are um, and coming to terms with that on your own, isolated from your peers, isolated from your friends, and that can be really confusing. Another thing that could be a consideration is young people during this time are probably more likely than not going to be staying with their family. And it's not always the case that families are accepting of their um, trans kids. And so that could be a dangerous environment. It could also be the case that even if they are accepting, we might not be ready to share that information yet. We might still be figuring things out. We might want to reflect on that ourselves and take a moment and to be surrounded by um, people you have that have known you for your entire life. That can be quite difficult to grapple with. Um, and so even though, like, like you said, representation has been getting better and we've seen a lot of cool things on TV, there's still a sort of distance between um, 
representation, which is kind of cosmetic, and a cultural shift or a systemic reform of how we feel about transness and about breaking the binary. And so I think what I found personally for me, which is super helpful with my mental health um, and what I've heard from some, from some other people is that community is really important. Being able to find those spaces where you will feel comfortable enough to express yourself and your gender in different ways um, is really important. Being able to find those people like we found on the show um, to experiment with that and experiment with different ways we want to express ourselves is really important. And just to touch on the fact that, I'm gonna wrap up soon, but just to touch on the fact that sometimes um, culturally it's difficult to compromise your um, ethnic or racial background and your culture with your queerness and figuring out how to um, complement that in yourself and not necessarily have to compromise those identities is something that's big. Sorry, I think I talked for a while. No, I, I love that. And um, I sort of see it as instead of compromise, evolve. <laughs> How can we evolve our, our, our cultural backgrounds or ethnicities um, to meet our queerness? And, and thank you for also sharing that there is a difference between trans and non-binary. And I encourage any of our audience members who are not aware to, to, to do the research and um, get a better understanding of it. Um, definitely important conversations to have. So thank you so much, Clover. Um, I said, I'm gonna pass it on to you for the next question. <clears throat> Ethan, so congratulations are in order. Uh, last year, you released your first song in your Damn. debut single. Yeah, you did. In your debut single, Emerald City, you self-reflected on your journey growing up. For many of us within the queer community, expressing ourselves creatively is a vital, <clears throat> is a vital, if not only, way forward. Can you share a bit of that journey with us? Was it freeing? Um, and what advice do you have for our queer youth listening today who are struggling to find their voice identity? For sure. Um, well, first I should say that my mental health journey has definitely been kind of co in hand with being queer. Like I said before, just having that extra level of stuff you need to deal with when also navigating mental health is something that not a lot of people talk about. So that's why I was super excited to be on this panel and get to kind of spread some light about that. Um, a lot of people, if not anybody uh, knows, but I feel kind of inspired from hearing your story on the show, Isis. But I was also in the hospital at one point uh, for mental health related reasons. And that's something for a long time, I kind of really just like pushed down and didn't want to tell anybody because I thought maybe it would make me look weaker and already when you're queer, you have this big target on your back that already people want to find everything that's wrong with you. And I didn't want to give people another reason to find everything that's wrong with me. Um, and I've just always, no matter what situation I've been dealt with or cards, I should say that I've been dealt in my life, I've always found myself back to performing and the arts. And that doesn't, it doesn't just limit itself to singing or dancing. It really does go within every single medium. Um, I would definitely say that writing and music is definitely my main one. So for Emerald City, it's funny, every time somebody asks me about it, I, I cringe a little bit because <laughs> I, <laughs> in the production process, I mean, Isis also has a song out, so she probably can relate to this, but um, I, in the production process, I listened to Emerald City at least 300 times. So um, now listening to that song, I, I kind of cringe a little bit, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> but I'm very happy, at, like nevertheless, I'm very happy that I've been able to help people if anything. Um, I didn't release Emerald City to do anything but help myself. It was really a way for me to close a chapter in my life that was definitely had a lot of trials and tribulations. Um, Emerald City is kind of me encapsulating my life between the ages of one and 18. So that's a lot of life lessons, a lot of trials and tribulations, a lot of character development, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, 
but yeah, I, I guess just with that whole experience and someone who's always kind of expressed themselves creatively, I've now been able to turn my passions into something to support my mental health, which has been super cool uh, because as someone who's always been a very strong and firm believer of therapy, the one thing that I've always been told is what's some ways we can cope. And that was always something that really drove me crazy because I was never good at coping. I didn't want to sit. I didn't want to write about my feelings. But then when I thought about it, I thought, hmm. I can make this into a song. Maybe I did want to sit and write about my feelings all of a sudden. You know what I mean? And although there's so many stories and things that people would never understand or uh, know just by listening the first time um, Emerald City, I also have a music video that I then accompanied it. And I was able to put in a lot of things that you wouldn't know by just listening to the lyrics. So yeah, music and music especially, but um, all kind of performing and creative aspects in my life has been a really good way to support my mental health and express myself and kind of be like, hey, this is what I'm going through. I can't tell you with the words I want to tell you, but this is my way of telling you. And so I guess just anybody who's out there who feels kind of the same, anyone who's going through something similar, just know you're not alone. And like I said before, it truly, as cheesy as it sounds, does get better. Um, you're not crazy for wanting to express yourself creatively. I think it's one of the most healthy things you can do for yourself. And even if you're not somebody who considers yourself a good dancer, a good singer, a good writer or whatever, just do it. Because if it makes you feel good, that's the only thing that should really matter in this whole lifetime, only doing things that make you feel amazing. Um, and if you ever wanted to talk, my DMs are always open. So shameless plug go follow me on instagram let's have these <laughs> let's have more of these conversations please and thank Put it you right here <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's uh either Brooklyn garcia <laughs> underscore um just search me up on all platforms please and thank you amazing um i had a chance to listen and to watch and it is very very good you should be so proud of yourself and to that point i totally agree with everything that you just said um, I started drag for a reason to do it for myself, to have some sort of cope, because I also don't like to speak about things. I also don't want people to look at me with sympathy or any of that stuff. That so one. having, yeah. So having drag or any kind of creative outlet really does help put your thoughts and feelings in a, in a constructive way. And when you, those things get received well, um, and even if they don't, it just makes you feel better. Do you know what I mean? hundred like, percent. You wrap all that trauma in a pretty little bow and call it a day. Yeah, 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 yeah. Fake it till you make it. <laughs> Fake it till you make it, baby. <laughs> Amazing. I um, might be biased, but I genuinely believe queer people are some of the most creative people out there. And it's, it's because we have to cope and we find ways to do it. We find ways that work for us. And um, I just love seeing all the ways that we express ourselves. So thank you. Wow. Hi, Friday. What I hey. love about um, all of you is you are all such advocates, activists, and we really didn't get a full glimpse of that on the show. And I know that you're heavily involved with TSAs in your school, and for a lot of communities who have lost access to their support groups, chosen families, and you know, support within school, especially GSAs who are a vital lifeline for emerging questioning queer youth or allies, we've lost access to this. And I know you've worked closely with developing a GSA in your school. So I'd love to know what trends you're noticing amongst your peers and how they've been feeling, how they've been coping, and what advice you have for creating safe spaces today so that we can foster in resilience, agency for 2S LGBTQ youth in our communities and institutions now that we're hopefully at the tail end of COVID or even just post COVID. Mm -hmm. Well, definitely. Um, if I'm speaking on my experience to high school I struggled a lot with anxiety and depression um I first came out in grade nine as bisexual and the thing that really affected me the most was that the school climate was honestly just full of like toxic masculinity and anything that was out of the norm which I mean subscribe right um they just treated me like an outsider and it was all the small things and there were 
days where I just felt so alone um, and so isolated and I never thought it would end. Um, I survived though, I mean, I'm here. Um, but honestly, what helped me um, was surrounding myself with queer culture and community. Um, for me, it was through music. Um, I'm so passionate about learning about queer history, um, all the queer activists who came who have come before me, um, and shows with queer people, um, seeing representation in other people. Um, with my school GSA, I was able to find a safe space on how to express myself, but also um, express myself around other people who are going through the same thing and seeing that it's a normal thing to have like, to feel bad sometimes. And you're not struggling through these things alone. There are people who love you and who will be by your side. And you just have to find those people because they're there. Um, yeah, anyway, so transitioning to online learning has been really difficult for a lot of people. Um, especially if you don't have a safe space at home. A lot of the people, especially in my school that I know, they can't be like themselves even around their parents. And I know especially when I was dealing with mental health, um, being at home was difficult because I was literally a different person. I would have a facade when, the moment I walked in the door, you know, or the moment I left school, if I'm being honest. Um, the lockdowns were hard. You know, I struggled a lot with my mental health, um, but the I relied a lot on those meetings. Um, and I got through it by like putting a lot of structure into my days. I'm getting a job, a lot of mental health walks, like a crap ton of those. <laughs> um, after reflecting, I realized that the transition from an in-person to an online um, GSA has also kind of been like, very my life recently because I moved to a new city. Um, I didn't know anyone at the beginning of the year. And I also had to like restructure my own support systems. Um, and what I've learned about that is it's so important to connect with your culture, um, whether it's music. Literally for me, it's like dancing in front of the mirror, dressing up in the most um, funniest things that you can find, the most affirming things crazy hairdos, just do it, just do it, go in front of the mirror, blast your favorite music, and feel good, because honestly, sometimes you just need to feel good, um, when you're feeling down, that is okay, like, literally, everyone feels that way, but it's, I think the powerful thing about when you're feeling down is that when you talk to other people who you trust, you can take off that um, that burden that you're carrying alone and you can carry it as a group, you know, because we're all in this together. Um, there's also therapy. It took me a long time to kind of like accept that it's okay not to be okay. Um, and that we don't know everything. And sometimes it's good to talk to a trusted professional, get diagnosed, and access proper treatments because sometimes you might not be feeling okay, but that like that's okay, but you need to get help. And that's that's also okay because once you deal with that, you can like get on with your life, you know, and start to learn how to love yourself. Um, for me, what's really kept me going is I have a passion for being a role model. You know, I want to make sure that. On the, on the days where I thought I lost hope, I've just been like really stubborn. I was like, no, I'm gonna like wait until I'm okay. And then I'm gonna tell life that like, look what I did, you know? I wanna be a role model to tell other people that you can do this too. Like, who knows, maybe you'll be on Drag Race one day, right? Um, but it's also really important to have discussions with people you love, um, especially with like intersecting identities, like, you experience barriers that um, that other people don't experience. And that can be really difficult to carry that burden alone. So talk to your girlies, you know, um, make it a night. But the most important part is not, not to be alone, you know, and find your community. I want to ask um, any other people, how do you guys create your own safe space? Um, because it's we all have our own ways of doing that.
I'll go first. Um, for me, I, <laughs> I was like, someone has to step up to the plate. Um, for me, like I kind of spoke about before, um, I just need to be by myself sometimes. And I think that's okay. Telling people and like Clover was talking about before boundaries saying like, you know, today I'm not going to go out with my friends today. I'm just going to kind of stay home and write a little bit or listen to music, go with my crazy hair in the mirror. Like you're saying, have a fun dance. And like, like, Everything that I do, even if it's for social media, um, I have a bunch of photo shoots that I've done. They've always been, they've always had some sort of theme or message behind it. Like the first time I ever did makeup on my page was a big thing. Um, I never officially came out just because I always felt like, I don't know, why, why do I have to come out if straight people don't need to come out? It was very like confrontational in that sense. Um, but then it really just became like, I can be myself 100% authentically without having to do this big coming out. And I know coming out was a big cathartic thing for a lot of different people. But for me, that just wasn't my story. And I'm very happy with the way that I came out because it was just very much living my life the way I've been living it, but then exploring new sides of myself. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing, Ethan. Um, I just wanted to touch on the importance of self-care, um, but it's just so important. And once you learn how to self-care, doing a little bit every single day is just super important. Um, yeah, thank you so much for letting no me story. Thank you, Friday. Thank you, Ethan. Friday, you are a role model. You are a, uh, a role model and um, you all are. And uh, it's, again, it's such a pleasure and privilege to be able to share this uh, platform with you all. I just want to pass it on to you. Yes, sorry, go ahead. I just want to do a little self-promo here, but <laughs> I have a passion. You know, I, I got it. A girl's got to work, you know? Um, but I have a passion for having these difficult conversations um and i'm going to be starting a podcast and having these difficult conversations so stay tuned on my socials um for future notifications on that you know i love that i love that yay friday what's your socials my social is queen underscore underscore friday <laughs> it sure is <laughs> right <laughs> Michaela, my love. Hi. Hi. Hello, hello. <laughs> For someone who is only 19, I think it's safe to say that you have already experienced a handful of lives. What impact has the past two years had on you as you work to balance reaching adulthood, creating a brand as a drag queen, and advocating for marginalized queer populations? Yeah. Uh... That's a very good question. It's a loaded question. <laughs> um, you have time, girl. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, well, you know, two years ago around this time, I, um, I had just moved back with my mom after um, living on my own for a while, um, just because there was like that miscommunication of like, um, of her understanding me and me um, trying to um, teach her about this, this life I'm living, I guess you could say, um, this person that I'm becoming. Um, and that was very hard to deal with. It, it affected me a lot because it, it felt like that locker situation where I just, I just seen my whole life up in flames. And I genuinely would have told you two years ago that I don't see my life going past 20, which is crazy that I'm about to see it in a few months. Um, but like, I, I genuinely um, couldn't see much for me. I didn't see much purpose. Um, and so uh, it took a lot of self-love. It took a lot of um, searching um, for people who loved and appreciated me for who I am to know that I'm worthy and that there is so much more, there is so much more coming, that there is greatness that um, is available out there that's headed my way. Um, there was one thing I used to always tell myself was, I am the Black Barbie. Um, and just that saying, just, it just basically goes to say that like, 
I am capable of doing anything that I believe I can do as long as I apply myself and believe in myself. And whenever I wake up every day, I remind myself that like, I am, I'm that girl. Like <laughs> I can do anything I believe in as long as, again, I apply myself and believe in myself um, and trust that the world will guide me to whatever is for me. Uh, and yeah, these, again, these past two years have just been the time to mature and to learn. Um, and while COVID has put a little bit of it to a halt, um, I'm still learning so much um, from the comfort of my home. So uh, yeah, that's what I've learned from the past two years. Thank you so much. Um, you sharing your story, it just, you remind me of everyone that I grew up with, with all the beautiful women that are around me. And I think, you sharing your story today on the show with me. I'm just, I'm so proud of you. And I always want you to feel safe. And I just, I love you so much. You're such a star. Like, girl, you got to get to 30 because you got to get to how old I am. It's all gonna be for you, okay? <laughs> I, I definitely I, will be seeing 30, but I will have better needs. <laughs> oh, look at that. I got to go. <laughs> <laughs> And cut. <laughs> That's my daughter. <laughs> Amazing. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, we have a lot of questions, but unfortunately, we don't have enough time to go through them all. So one that um, I would love to pass along and any takers for this, um, just, you know, based on your experience, not on Drag Race or just since Drag Race, I'd love to know what role clothing plays in your mental health. And if, if anybody wants to elaborate on that. Uh, I can definitely start with that. Um, sure. Because uh, I love that question just because um, I, after high school, I had actually gone into fashion, um, fashion school. Um, and so that fashion itself, I talk about a lot how um, it's played a big role in who I am as a person. Um, people don't necessarily see clothing as like a big thing, but I do because it does, it helps me feel uh, affirmative in, in who I am and, um, you know, who I identify as. Uh, I, when I was younger, I always was like that fashion diva that my mom would take to the mall and help her pick, her up, pick out her outfits. And I just remember thinking back like, I want to wear those when I'm older, but never being able to talk about it out loud. Um, and so when it comes to fashion and um, my mental health, it, it eases me um, in a sense that like it helps me um, feel comfortable in navigating the world. It helps me have that armor um, that tells me like you are a woman and you can go out in the world and strut in those pumps because you are that girl. Um, so yeah, that's all. Amazing. Anybody else want to add to that? I know Clover, you you perked up. <laughs> I yeah, I I think Michaela really said it. I just think clothing is such a powerful form of self-expression, um, especially related to gender. I think that it is such a way to communicate yourself and it's such a way to shape how other people perceive you. Um and I think gender, because it's a social performance, it's so much about shaping the way other people perceive you, um, which could be a negative thing, but in most cases, it's a great way to like creatively self-express. Um, and I have so much fun with it. I think clothing is so cool. Um, and I like like thrifting and stuff. So yeah, I don't know. I just like clothing, yeah. There's a lot of joy. Um, I don't think everybody understands how far it can take you. Thank you. Um, we did have a question for Isis that I'd, I'd love to. I know I'd, I'd love to know if, if you do happen to have me. It's like, you know, during your lowest times, did you have any phrases that helped you cope? Are there any sayings or phrases that really resonate with you, or any other coping mechanisms? Um, I I do a lot of work by myself so when I had those really like down moments it was really basically just like I need a moment like everybody just leave me alone like 
I have th I have this thing even still to this day when I'm feeling down or when when my mental health is not at its greatest somebody asking me if I'm okay makes it worse and <laughs> yeah <laughs> um so for me myself I just need to shut everything off around me as long as I can shut everything off and do it in a safe way where like I'm not going to be alone and it's going to make me feel worse than I am I think just being quiet with myself and like talking to myself and telling me like I'm worthy everything is going to be fine and even if it's not like I choose I choose now at this point in my life even though I've went through so many terrible things I don't think I would take back any of those things because I love the person that I am today. They have helped create the person that I am today. They've helped me win the crown. They've helped me just love the world and love everyone. So even though things are bad and I just, ah, <laughs> why? <laughs> Everything will be fine guys. I promise. I promise. If I can do it, you guys can do it. And it is, it is not something that's cons that's going to like the next day immediately get better. I am 35 years old. All of this stuff happened when I'm younger and I continuously work on it. I continuously still have problems. What changes is the way that you look at those situations and allow them to affect your life. And now at this point that I've worked so hard for, when those bad things still happen, I take them as a positive and use them to grow as a better person. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you all. Um, we could clearly keep talking, but um, I'm sure a lot of our guests and maybe panels are hungry and uh, would like to resume their evenings. But this has been so impactful, so appreciative. And it's because of important conversations that we've had today that we're able to hopefully empower others. And thanks to important initiatives like Bell Let's Talk, we're truly able to shine a spotlight on the importance of addressing mental health discourse. So taking place tomorrow, January 26th, Bell Let's Talk Day encourages people in Canada to keep listening, talking, and being there for ourselves and each other. You can join the conversation to break the stigma around mental illness and to help create positive change. You can learn more at bell.ca forward slash let's talk. I wanna thank you all for attending our, and our amazing panelists. You are just a glimpse of our up and coming next generation. And I can't tell you how encouraging that is. You can learn more about our panelists by visiting our website at itgetsbettercanada.org. Um, and then hopefully um, getting a sense of all the great things that they're doing, the music, the podcasts, and so on and so on. It's just, they're all up and coming stars. Uh, please follow them all on, on social. Uh, Clover has amazing art and Michaela, you, your drag is continuing to inspire and, it, and I don't know if it's safe to say or fair to say that it's just the beginning, but I can't wait to keep watching. So before you go, a final reminder that we are offering a separate session for anyone who would like um, some one-on-one -on -one time with Bill to discuss their mental health or that of a loved one. Um, I'm sharing the uh, link in Zoom and uh, it will begin shortly after eight. Isis, do you have any closing words or can you tell us what's next for you, where we can find you? Um, I love you guys so much. I love everyone on the panel. I love everyone that is tuning in. Um, please continue to see what's going on with It Gets Better. It, ah, <laughs> is this what we're doing? Am I one of the cool kids now? <laughs> Um, thank you guys so much for supporting me, supporting all these kids, and supporting this amazing organization. Um, please continue to work on yourselves and everything. It gets better. We're trying not to say it, but it does get better, as cheesy as it is, I promise. And um, you will see me around. As soon as this is all lifted, I will be out spreading love, and I can't wait to see every single one of you. I love you guys. Can't wait to see you. Love you. Thank you all so much. <laughs>
Bye, everyone.